follow you, is chasing you, not shout bad things at you, right? Well, shouting is shouting, following is following. That's the whole other. And you said that to me? Yes. All right, so good morning, everyone. We're about five minutes after, so I'm sure we'll still have a few people come in to join us, but we're going to get started, so we have plenty of time. Um, my name is Bear Atwood, and I'm the chair of the um, National Boards Committee on Advanced, Advancing Voting Rights, and these are our committee members. Want to introduce yourselves quickly? Hi, I'm Judy Paulson from Now New York State and Now New York City. Uh, I'm on the board from the Northeast region. Good morning, I'm Meredith Ackman. I'm the uh, Southern District uh, representative and I'm also uh, hosting, from the hosting uh, community for you, for you today. So welcome to our town. So before we actually dive into the, the meat of the workshop, I wanted to talk to you about um, the National Action Program more generally. Uh, for those of you who are not new to now, as you remember a few years ago, we restructured um, and the conference rules now say that the National Board brings strategic action plans to the National Conference. So this is, this is part of that strategic action plan. Um, and we have several action plans. As you know, in this year, in 2017, 2017, see I'm putting this back, we entered into an especially challenging political arena, an arena that requires all of our collective resistance. The National Action Program is part of, the NAS, of NAS contribution to that resistance. The current the current political reality has inspired many across the country to increase their engagement in grassroots activism and political processes and to take part in leading the societal changes country so needs. The National Action Program is comprised of five campaigns, ratify the ERA, protect immigrant rights, advance voting rights, mobilize for reproductive justice, and what is now called end the criminalization of trauma each of these five campaigns provides activists with tools and resources to mobilize and to take action. So in this presentation, we're going to be going, are you moving these for me? Yes. <laughs> I realize I can't see it, so. In this presentation, we're going to be going over the Advanced Voting Rights Campaign and the current state of voter suppression more broadly across our country. We hope we can offer some insight into what we've been working on the state of voting rights in America today and where we hope to go in the future. So what's the issue? Voting rights and access to the ballot has been a civil rights issue for decades. Current voter suppression has maintained itself in a variety of ways, including racial gerrymandering, voter ID laws, and the elimination of resources for voters. Unfortunately, voter suppression disproportionately impacts women of color, the elderly, and low-income women. For example, 34% of women do not have access to photo identification with their current name. This means that over 43 million, or 43 million women are required to present both a birth certificate and proof of marriage, divorce, or name change in order to vote. These bureaucratic hurdles ex exclude legitimate voters who do not have documentary proof of their citizenship, and these citizens are primarily women. So before we delve into the current state of play with voting rights, we've put together a brief history into some of the most important moments in voting rights for women. We begin with the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. This moment in history was the first conference of women that addressed and articulated the socio-political benefits of women's suffrage on a large scale. By 1920, women had fought for the right to vote and won. However, this did not guarantee access to the ballot for all women. Since the early 1930s, women of color have been systemically excluded from the voting process through a number of tactics. Some of these tactics included institutional disenfranchisement, such as grandfather clauses and 
literacy tests, while other tactics were informed through acts of violent suppression. From 1950 on, civil rights activists paid careful attention to the state of voting rights for racial minorities in the country, fighting for opportunities to address rampant voter suppression that was occurring particularly across the South. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was the first major piece of legislation since the 19th Amendment that addressed access to the ballot. Its main goal was to force Southern states to uphold the 14th and 15th Amendment, barring any state from discriminating against individuals based on race. The Voting Rights Act was expanded in 1975, 1982, 1992, and 2006. However, in 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled to eliminate the pre-clearance clause in Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. In a 5-4 ruling, the court found that Sections 4B and 5 exceeded the limit of federal jurisdiction and there was no longer a need for pre-clearance in states with a history of voter suppression. In layman's terms, states no longer needed to enact laws that no States no longer enact voting laws that disproportionately discriminate against minorities, so preclearance is unnecessary. This has led to where we are now. And I pass this over to Judy. Thanks, Bear. So let me talk a little bit about where we are today. Um, so due to the precedent set by Shelby, states now have a latitude to craft laws that disproportionately disenfranchise low-income voters and racial minorities. Slide, please. Um, since the Supreme Court's ruling in Shelby v. Holder, eliminating that pre-clearance, there has been an increase in voter suppression at the state level. Coincidence? Who think so? No. Voter suppression has three main mechanisms. Racial gerrymandering, voter ID and registration laws like Bear was describing, and distribution of election day resources. Racial gerrymandering is the practice of manipulating the boundaries of voting districts, confining large numbers of people of color to singular districts. Gerrymandering, just in general, extends beyond racial discrimination. It can be tied to a political party affiliation also. African American and Latino voters historically, and currently, vote overwhelmingly Democratic. So this likelihood increases when we look at African American and Latino women. The second method of suppression is voter ID laws. Currently, only 66% of women have access to identification that has their current name on it. This is made worse when we factor in the income levels. One in eight women live in poverty, and according to a recent study, those living below the poverty line are twice as likely to lack proper ID to vote. Finally, we can look at the lack of resources allotted to particular communities. In general, minority communities receive fewer voting machines, fewer poll workers, and fewer publicly accessible voting sites. These communities may also receive broken machines and really old equipment, the stuff that's left over after the other communities are done with it. There's, in addition, an absence of ESL, English as a Second Language Workers, on site at polling locations. That's a requirement of the 1982 Amendment to the Voting Rights Act. We can also look to states like North Carolina that have cut times of early voting, making it more difficult for working people to vote. These cuts also include the removal of same-day regis registration and the closing of polling locations, making it much harder for people to cast their vote quickly and efficiently. And all this lack of resources, both tangible and otherwise, makes it that much harder for people to cast their votes. So what do these tactics look like just on paper? Well, since the Supreme Court ruling in Shelby versus Holder, we continue to see the fallout occurring state by state by state. We've highlighted the two recent, most recent cases here, including a case that in Wisconsin, where the U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear in the upcoming session. Let's start with the good. In Cooper v. Harris, formerly known as McCrory v. Harris, voters in the state of North Carolina accused their General Assembly of using race to determine its redistricting plans following the 2010 census. In a shocking turn of events, the Supreme Court ruled five to three that the Assembly actually did rely too heavily on race to make its redistricting decisions, and it ruled against the state. What made this case so unprecedented was that one of the concurring judges was, if you can believe it, Clarence Thomas, who is considered the most conservative judge sitting on the Supreme Court today. Now, breaking news, so far we've seen that Neil Gorsuch, the newest appointee, 
is voting in lockstep with him. We'll have to see how that comes out, but we seem to have two of them right now. So moving on to the bad, we have the case of Bethan Hill. Bethan Hill was another situation of racial redistricting. This was in Virginia. Virginia voters accused their legislature of violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment through their intentional attempts to suppress the vote of African Americans through their new redistricting policies. Unfortunately, in this case, the Supreme Court could not come to a clear consensus and remanded the ruling back to the district court for further analysis. More to come on that. But for the good, last week the Supreme Court agreed to hear an appeal over districts in Wisconsin after a lower court ruled that the state's new redistricting plan was <coughs> to quote an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. This is the first time in 10 years that the Supreme Court has taken on a case on partisan gerrymandering. In this stage, we're beginning to acknowledge that a large number of these tactics being used are to bolster the power of the Republican Party. So let's move on to the Trump factor. Two really the morning you say use the, the word the two word. Um, <clears throat> the 45th president's administration is accelerating these encroaching attacks on voting rights. In addition to state legislation, Trump put forth an executive order creating the Presidential Commission on Election Integrity. <laughs> that commission, is an attempt, despite the name, is an attempt to validate Trump's false narrative around, oh, so many, so much voter fraud happening with illegal immigrants voting and all that stuff that we know is nonsense. Uh, this committee is largely headed by notorious anti-voting rights politi politicians like Chris Kobach and Jeff Sessions. In an uplifting turn of events, though, it was announced last Thursday that Pat Senators Patrick Leahy and Terry Sewell were reintroducing the Voting Rights Advancement Act to address what's happening at the state and federal level. So we have some hope from there. We need to keep an eye on that. So, um, in the news today yeah. or last night, they said that um, they're going to allow uh, the federal government is asking each state for all their voter information your name, address, last four, your social security, your party, and voting record. And two states have refused to do this. That sounds kind of scary. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, that, thank you for raising that. We'll see how that comes out. So that's something we've got to watch. Um, so, um, so far we've been talking about voting in sort of a mostly a broad sense. So why does this matter to now? Why is this a feminist issue? Uh, well, we've mentioned already that voter suppression is an issue that does greatly affect women. Studies have found that women are disproportionately affected by voter suppression laws. There's uh, three reasons for that. Women, and particularly women of color, make up most of the low-income voters. Therefore, voter suppression laws that require a new ID are a heavier burden on them. And when it comes to distribution of services, a 2015 study found that 500,000 people live 10 miles away from their nearest polling site. This really affects those without access to a car or without access to decent public transportation. Secondly, women are also the primary caregivers to their families. Therefore, laws that remove early and absentee voting make it much more difficult for women to vote. And finally, and let's, let's be honest about this, these laws were targeted, targeted attacks from the GOP to hinder Democratic voters from reaching the ballot, and women of color in particular tend to vote Democratic. 94% of black women we know voted for Clinton in 2016. So, we have a game. We have a fun game. Fun game. Um, you are going to hand out the scenarios for us? The scenarios right, are on so the chairs. We're going to do a game. Oh, they're on the chairs. No. We're, going to, we're going to play a game. We're going to have you divide into four groups. So each of the each side of the room divide into two groups, if you will. And we're going to have you um, test how quickly and efficiently you'd be able to cast your ballot if you were one of these scenarios. So you can divide into two groups on this side and two groups on this side. Each of your groups is going to be given a scenario. Each scenario represents a different person in a different community who needs to vote. I know it's Thank you. 
You have 10 minutes, and then you're just going to come back and tell, tell us all, as groups, how you're, how you're going to cast your ballot. So quick 10 minutes. Let us know when you're done. Thank you. 
have been better. Yeah, just say we're just going to get it. Everybody should be registered with birth. Great, thank you. And you know, I think um, 
you all learn one of the things that many people learn, and that's they have assumptions about what the laws are in their state, and it turns out they're completely wrong. And so well-informed voters are always most likely to get to the polls. Um, all right, Joe, want to go next? All right. With the <laughs>
So that is a federal law. So um, it's just a question of her being willing to take two hours off to go to the polls. But it, it says we, we have it very easy in Florida to vote by mail. And she says that in Georgia, the options are limited. We don't know what that means, but we felt like she should call her local um, political party and ask them what the actual laws are for absentee ballot um, and try and do that. That would be the first choice. The second choice would be to take those two hours off, take the kids with her, as you said, as a learning experience. Um, and that's it. Right? But it takes two hours to vote. Right. Oh, yeah, I forgot. There were two lines. Some of the lines. Yeah. Yeah. The, the lines are a problem. So really, it's, it all comes down to absentee voting or voting by mail. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, okay. That is it. We did discuss souls to the polls, Sunday voting. So, yeah, we could try. Hopefully, there is Sunday voting in, in Georgia. No, but they said they. Well, there was something about that. It was getting eliminated or. It will be. Yeah. In Georgia or all Georgia? Georgia. Just Georgia. It will be eliminated on Sunday. It's eliminated here in Florida. No, it has been eliminated. No, they, See, no, they, they moved had, it one week. They moved it one week. It used to be the, the Sunday before the election. Now it's two Sundays before. So that's what they did. But we still have Sunday voting in, in Florida. Up to your supervisor. I just wanted to mention that the mail-in ballot is something that a lot of good feminists are pushing, and yes. the all-female uh, officials in state government in Oregon have pioneered that technique, and that is a good model for people to look at, and I think pressuring our legislators to go in the states where we have a chance of getting that pass is a great idea, and I just want to mention my favorite thing of recent months in the special election in Montana, and where they were considering having a mail-in ballot, the head of the Republican Party said, no, too many people will vote and the Democrats <laughs> won't win. Awesome, thank you all. And our fourth group, not least, uh, we have uh, Ella. Ella, I am a 68-year-old widowed retiree from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, she lives in a predominantly suburban congressional district. Uh, she, I, I must make it to the ballot. My uh, designated polling place is 2.5 miles away from a widowed retiree here. Uh, unfortunately, I do not drive. My children currently live in D.C. and New York. My state does not allow early or absentee voting. Though I am a registered voter Democrat, I've had difficulty in the past voting. In Virginia, you must have a photo ID to vote, which I do not have. I have a birth certificate, but I've been told that that would not be enough. And I also have to show a passport or state ID. It doesn't say, but I assume she doesn't have either of those. I'm on a fixed income of 700 a month through Social Security. I spend approximately a quarter of that on medication that I need for a number of ailments, and the election is four days away. Okay. So the first uh, first step, as in all things, is call your grandkids to get online <laughs> and find out what documents she needs to establish re establish a residency, or call the state ID office. She's more likely to get a response from her kids, your grandkids. Uh, call the local Democratic Party. See if there's a precinct captain who's who has a, who's got a get out the vote campaign uh, who can help her to get to get her ID. Uh, and see if they've got people for their get up and get her to the polls. Uh, and, and at the state uh, ID office, she'll need $29. Uh, so that takes commitment given her, her low income here, and that's as far as we got. Well, we also found out that she can't renew it in person, it has to be by mail. Well, I thought you said you got it by, you, you came back by mail. Well, it came back by mail, so four days isn't enough, so that was a problem. She was just waiting too long to get the ID. So she should probably just get the ID anyways, because she, she's going to need it. But it wouldn't get her in time for voting. <laughs> Some states will waive um, ID payment as long as you can prove that you're on food stamps or on Medicaid, and it sounds like she's getting the minimum social security payment of the 700 or probably 735. 
Um, basically, they will waive it as long as you can go in and show proof, such as proof of food stamps and proof of social security disability. So she needs to talk to somebody who knows the answers. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully someone will have access to someone. But there is that assumption about it. So we really wanted to um, to just raise raise all of our consciousness a little bit about how complex it can be to vote. Um, all right, so we're going to move on. Oh, do we have another question? Gordy? Uh, just a comment. You know, we've been talking about you know, the process of voter registration and voter suppression. But one thing that we have to be clear on is Secretary of State's matter. Yes. They're the ones who are in control of our state election system. Right. So those elections, pay attention to it and get somebody who's going to correct the problems. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on in our presentation. Meredith? about strategies um, and some of the things that are so important are that um, the reasoning behind why we have to strategize why is it so important to women what are some of the issues that that don't get brought up when women aren't at the table um, and I just want to shout them out so just give me some some uh, some things that are important to you that you don't think are going to be talked about unless we're there abortion Reproductive rights in a, in a positive way, right? Right? <laughs> yes. Competency. Competency, what do you mean? I mean that um, just the assumption that um, you're not intelligent and the only thing that matters is the way you look. You're not taking seriously. That's the base for everything. It doesn't matter how much education you have, how much experience you have, that is the bottom line. Okay, so gender That's stereotyping? Yeah. Got it. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Equal pay. Thank you. Yes. Equal pay. Yes. Um, how about uh, we've been talking about um, Family Leave Act. The Family Leave Act is something that we're working on in Florida. I don't know how many of the how many other states are working on stuff on Family Leave Act. Very good. Oh, well, huh. <laughs> thanks, Corey. Discriminatory education rules for colleges and education because out has a new program that we're sweeping across. Florida has adopted it, in which in order to be accredited, you have to follow your graduates for five years. They have to be employed, and our university is in danger of losing our college education on the University of South Florida because if a young woman gets pregnant and decides to stay home with her child, that's her choice, she is not employed. Your program is D. And if that, you know, that is unfair. That's what if a young man stays home? Huh? What if a young man decides to stay home? Yes. Got it. Very cool. So that's another one too. So so not again gender stereotyping, not 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 allowing them to, to move forward and, and saying that men don't stay home because sometimes they do now. That's which is which is great. Um, anyone else? Yes. These strategies that people who are not able to vote, that they are able to vote, their their voice will be heard, is that the question is? We're talking about um, we're not into strategies yet, but we're gonna talk about that in a second. I just wanted to find out some of the issues that we focus on that yes. Okay, so basically uh, two. First of all, uh, immigrant rights and yes. people who have a uh, low income, that could be and people who have uh, child care issues. I mean that's a whole family uh, child care issues or parental elderly uh, um, family members. Sure. So okay. And and predominantly women end up taking care of their elderly family members as well. Women so and that. children. Yes. Okay, so let's yes. Thank you. And you know, and all of our priority issues are pretty much are brought into that. So we're talking about you know economic justice and for, for specifically for women because our issues are a little bit different than, than those for men. Um, I see that our slides are back up. So let me go ahead and get into um, the completion of the formalized section, and then we can continue talking about some of these things that we that we've deemed incredibly important. So um, the voting rights campaign strategy. Uh, in order to address the serious issues raised so far, NOW's National Action Program has crafted a concrete strategy to address, engage, and promote activism around voting rights. First, we focus on raising awareness. Um, that's some of the stuff that we did this morning here that, that we recognize um, other people might not necessarily get. The National Action Program has created a number of resources that apply a feminist lens to voting rights. Some of these tools include information, briefs on racial gerrymandering, we heard that mentioned this, uh, this morning, um, as well as an easy to read breakdown of some of the myths around voter suppression. Another important aspect of awareness in raising is talking about why feminists should run for office. I'm gonna say that again, run for office. <laughs> <laughs> We need to talk. <laughs> um, this is so important because um, one of our goals is to encourage progressive and feminist women to run for, for open seats on a local, state, and judicial, and federal level. As they say, if you aren't at the table, you're on the menu. How many times have we heard Patricia Ireland say that? Um, and uh, when we focus on the importance of engagement, Primarily through social media, through our various social media channels, we have been able to promote a number of events, including our Voting Rights Facebook Live panel, uh, which garnered over 4,000 views. Who's seen that? Anyone? Okay, find it. <laughs> Look for it online. You're going to want to see it. Um, on our advocacy work with the Voting Rights Alliance. Which leads me to our final strategy, conscious coalition building. National Now is a member of the Voting Rights Alliance along with approximately 20 other organizations such as Rock the Vote, Rainbow Push, and the Hip Hop Caucus. Yes, the Hip Hop Caucus, if you haven't seen it, look it up. Um, through our work with these coalitions, we've been able to build a stronger relationship with legislators on the Hill who are closely working in, 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 D in D.C. to halt voting laws that suppress our access to the ballot. They're trying to stop us from getting there. 
What do we do when we have a hurdle in front of us? We go over it. We just do. Um, one example of this is our relationship with the Voting Rights Co Congressional Caucus. And a few days ago, the Voting Rights Alliance held a congressional briefing with legislators on the Hill addressing some of the many issues affecting voters in, in the states. Next slide, please. Thank you. The future of advanced voting rights. Looking ahead, there are several ways we can continue to engage on this issue. First and foremost, we want to support and advocate for the passing of Voting Rights Advancement Act. The Voting Rights Advancement Act. Watch it, it's going to pass. Uh, in the Senate and the House to counteract some of the damage done through the Shelby ruling. Another important piece of our plan is advocacy around people on the ground who feel the effects of suppression every day. And that's voter suppression as well as other kinds of suppression. Through grassroots uh, actions, we ask that all states, particularly states where voter suppression is rampant, lobby against legislation that, contains, that continues to marginalize voters and advocate for more opportunities for all to participate in our democracy. We need to not only fight against the bad, uh, the, the stuff that's trying to stop us, but we also need to ensure that we're advocating uh, to move forward. For example, we're currently working with state leaders to mobilize around Florida's Voting Rights Restoration Act. This act is a critical ballot measure that would re-enfranchise over 1.6 million people in this state. Measures like these are the ones we ask that our chapters advocate around. When we can fight in every state, it will undoubtedly make a difference. Finally, and most importantly, we know that it is imperative that women run for office. Run for office. I'm just going to keep saying it all weekend and every day. <laughs> we also know that the 2018 election is, is critical for us. Therefore, we propose a heavy push and emphasis on electing progressive female candidates to office. And, and, and feminist male candidates for office, too. Um, when women run, our issues are better represented in, pol in political spaces. We also know that there has been a, up, an upswing in women interested in running for office following the election of he who shall not be named. <laughs> Now I want to ensure that the right of that the right female candidates, the right women candidates, and the right feminist male candidates are the ones who take office, progressive, intersectional, and most importantly representative of the issues that women face every day. Every day. And so we came up with a resolution. Oh, you guys are so on point. Um, so we, we have a resolution that we um, that we have presented that's going to be, that we're gonna see again on Sunday. And did you wanna do the first part or do you want me to go forward? Okay. Um, so the resolution reads, in case you can't see it, I'm gonna read it for you. Now, now that we've presented where we've been, no, sorry, there were a couple of changes, so I just wanna make sure I go with the right. Um, Therefore be it resolved that the National Organization for Women 2017-2018 National Action Program will include an advanced voting rights campaign to stop voter suppression schemes at the local, state, judicial, and national levels. Increase awareness about the disproportionate impact of voter suppression on women, and especially women of color, low-income persons, seniors, and younger people, which is some of the um, scenarios we have today. And pass the Voting Rights Advancement Act to stop gerrymandering intended to discriminate against communities of color and women, and women voters, voter purging and disenfranchisement. And be it further resolved that now we'll work with our allies and coalition partners in support of state level legislative, electoral, and litigation strategies to combat interest instances of voter suppression, especially, but not, but not exclusive to, states such as North Carolina, Texas, Virginia, Florida, Michigan, Georgia, and Alabama. And? And, be it finally resolved, and you all should have these on your chair, 
that now will work with the Now PAC and its allies <coughs> to elect feminist candidates, especially women and other marginalized people, to local, state, judicial, and federal office, and to educate voters about the high stakes for women in local, state, judicial, and federal elections in 2017 and 18. And so you all know, what, what's gonna happen is, each of the national action programs will bring a resolution on Sunday to the floor to ask for the, because the conference is the supreme governing body, to ask for the conference's approval to work on that strategic plan over the next year. So this is the resolution that's gonna to come to the floor from our campaign. Um, and you'll see there'll be five total that will come to the floor from, that, that come from board committees um, to the board and then directly to the floor. And so you'll see these all on <coughs> Sunday morning at our fun plenary session where we work on resolutions. Um, so I really, what I really hope is that you all will, will read them and think about them if you think, if you see places where you think something's missing or that you think there'd be some great addition, you know, you can make those amendments, request those amendments on the floor, but we would definitely ask for your support for our resolution on Sunday as well. Um, so now we have time for questions. No questions. <laughs> yes. So there is a there the, one of the things that the um, action center is working with Florida on is and so Meredith, if I'm going to pass it to you. Uh, yeah, so that's what we were talking about the Voting Rights Suppression Act, and what we've been doing is um, it is um, we've been getting ballot signatures. Um, so that we could get it onto the ballot. Sorry, not ballot signatures. Um, constitutional amendment. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we're basically we're trying to make it a constitutional amendment so that people can still vote. And what you know, I've done research in the past, and and what I've found was that there are some states that actually allow prisoners to vote while they're there. And I think, it, do we have Maine? Yes. Is it, Mississippi does it. Yeah, and, and what they've found is that when people are treated like people, the when in the in the, the in the states where the recidivism rate is much different than what it is in states where people where where prisoners are treated like animals, like you know, where they're they're not given given basic rights and voting rights is, is, is some of those basic rights. So as far as we're concerned that's what we've done is we've taken it to ballot initiatives. Every event that we've gone to, we have we, we have the option of voting. I mean, of um, signing a petition, um, and and that's what we're going to do. We're going to take it to the people and let them let them decide. Yeah. Um, Indian River County. I'm the chair of the Democrats, and we're going canvassing once a month, door to door, to ask people to sign a petition. Excellent. Thank you. Um, did you still have your a question? Uh, Voter crisis is not, you know, Could you speak up, please? Whatever. I'm from California, so we don't have as many issues. Maybe. So, the the is, so the question is, so the question is, what do we do if we want to help in states where where the voting rights are prohibited in in, in a lot of ways? Um, do you want anyone? I mean, I I think. Um, I think if you're interested in, you know, in, in a particular issue, so if you're interested in working on voter suppression, that the staff and the Action Center can connect you up to activists in other states, um, pretty, not maybe easily, but they can connect you up to activists in other states. And I wanted to also talk just about the, the disenfranchisement <laughs> issue. Mississippi um, has been, we've been working legislatively for, well, I've been there 10 years, and. We've been doing it. They've been working legislatively, trying to change our really bad laws for a lot longer than that, and uh, we find it incredibly <coughs> discouraging. Um, Mississippi has sort of weird laws because we do allow people who are eligible to vote to vote while they're in prison, but 
the only people, the only felons who can vote are felons with drug convictions. Every other felony, you're barred for life unless you get a legislative, <coughs> unless you get a legislative law passed, particularly allowing you to vote again or get pardoned by the governor. Yeah, and so you're barred for life. Well, that's interesting. And, You know, the other thing is we're, we're getting closer to having that ballot initiative, and those are some of the things that, that we've done when, when Florida is done with our, with our, um, with our elections for, the, for that session. I always end up like, helping the other states by calling people, um, and so some of the, the organizations might be doing that. If you want to meet me um, after, afterwards, um, I'll uh, take down your contact information and see if I can put you in, in touch with some of the people that are doing that work on the ground in Florida so that we can... So we can get the help because if you're willing to help, we're, we're going to take it. Yes? You were asking about strategies. I think one of the key strategies when you're talking about the restoration of felons' rights is for you, if you're in a state that does not allow that, to look up and see where felons. Because in the state of Florida, it is a third degree felon, and you can lose your right to go forever if you release helium blooms up into the atmosphere. And last year, 17 people in the state of Florida lost the right to vote because they let helium blooms go up into the atmosphere. So if you look up what are felons, because generally people think of felons as murderers and rapists. And we even forget about the low-level drug offenses. And also, in many states, DUIs can be considered, and you can lose your, your right to vote for that. So I think education is a key. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a key, a, a key point. Is to inform people and educate people and ask them, do you really think that somebody who was getting ready to get engaged and had a bouquet of helium balloons and when he kissed the girl because she said yes, went up into the atmosphere, a police officer decided to take because people couple was black decided to take and enforce this rule, oh and these two young people lost the right to vote forever, basically, because it's impossible, almost virtually impossible in Florida to get that reinstated. So I think by educating people as to what are felons in your state, consider stuff, that would put people on your side. What I tell them, because I've done a whole bunch, is this Republican Congress, our legislature, has turned everything into a felony yep. so that they don't have to let the people vote. Right. And that's the intention when they do it. Yep. Yes. And that yes. works yes. every time. For profit prisons become right. the norm. Right. 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 That's right. Right. That's right. The good news is we're doing work to stop this. And, we'll, and I, I firmly believe that we're going to be able to change these laws so that it's more um, and Florida fair. should go, you should go to the Constitutional Revision Commission meetings and stand up and speak about that and each time you get a chance to get a coalition to go with you. When does that be? They're almost done, aren't they? Well, they're having their meetings now, they're around the state, and you can go to crc.com or whatever. And you can find out where they're going to be. But once they put together their proposal, they're going to add public input again. Do we have any other questions? Then thank you all for coming. Thank you. On your way out the door, make sure that you see Tyler for the handout. Okay, handout. Thank you.